Another scientist, whose last name was Charles, investigated the relationship between volume and temperature. Have you ever wondered why hot air rises? How does a hot air balloon work? Have you ever seen one of these? These are really cool. Oh, yeah. The iPad and I have been arguing lately. So, big, big balloon. It's got a little hole in the top and a bigger hole here, and in the basket, they've got this ginormous burner, right? And it goes roar, and it just, it heats the air. And the hot air rises and fills up the balloon and eventually gets warm enough that the balloon rises off the ground. There's no helium involved, it's just air. And then if they want the balloon to come down or to stop going up so fast, they turn the burner down and let the air cool down a little bit, and they can control the up and down by controlling the temperature of the gas. Well, when you heat up some air, does the mass of the air change? No. The mass stays the same, but the volume changes. The volume changes, and so that causes the density to change. Heating a gas causes the volume to increase if the pressure is the same. The pressure inside this balloon is the same as the outside pressure because it's open. It can't be pressurized because it's open. If, if there was pressure in here, some of the gas would come out and it would maintain constant pressure. So when you change the temperature, when you increase the temperature, you increase the volume. Remember that density is the mass divided by the volume. The mass isn't changing. The volume is getting larger. We're dividing by a larger number. That causes the density to go down. And just like lower density things float in higher density liquids, that's why water floats and metal sinks. Because metal has a higher density than water, and wood has a lower density. Lower density gases will float in higher density gases. That's why helium balloons float, because helium is less dense than air. If we graph volume versus temperature, we get a nice straight line. So as you increase the temperature of the gas, the volume goes up and the relationship is linear. It's very nice. Forms this beautiful line and we can extrapolate the line, which means to draw the line past where the actual data is and draw it down here. And then it's always interesting, where is it going to end up at zero? Well, we find that it crosses the y-axis at zero at a temperature of minus 273 degrees Celsius. And that's significant. What would it mean to have a negative volume? Can you have a negative volume? Is that possible? Well, you can have a vacuum with no particles in it, and you can take that vacuum and squeeze it down to nothing, but you can get maybe to zero with no particles in there, but can you make it negative? You can't. At least not unless we start talking about weird science fiction things and matter, matter and antimatter and things like that. So negative volume is impossible. So looking at this, we see that as the volume decreases because the temperature is going down, eventually it's going to get to a point where it has zero volume, and it really can't go past that. And so we call this temperature absolute zero. If you do this with different gases, you're going to get different lines, but they're all going to intersect at that same point. So that's called absolute zero. And that's what the Kelvin scale is based on. So this guy Charles was a French mathematician and physicist. Um, he lived in the late 1700s and the early 1800s. And he studied this. Um, and this relationship assumes that the pressure and the amount of gas are constant. This is a direct relationship. It's called Charles' law. The volume is directly proportional to the temperature. Temperature goes up, volume goes up. Temperature goes down, volume goes down. So you can change the volume by changing the temperature. You can also change the temperature by changing the volume of the gas. 
and that's how your air conditioner works or your refrigerator. By compressing and expanding gases, you can cause their temperature to change. We have to use the Kelvin scale when we're dealing with gases. Temperatures must be expressed in Kelvins. In the problems, they'll generally give you the temperature in Celsius because that's what the thermometers are marked in. That's what we measure things in is Celsius. And most of the time, that works just fine, but for gases, it doesn't. The reason has to do with um, math, actually. So the equation of a line is y equals mx plus b. b is the y-intercept. If b is 0, then y equals mx. y was volume, and x was temperature. And then you have a direct proportionality. If you've got an intercept in here, it messes it up, and it makes it a lot more complicated. Could you do it? Yeah. But why do you want to make things harder? You, you have to do a lot of other stuff in order to make that work. So we define the Kelvin temperature scale to be convenient for this. Because the relationship between Kelvin and Celsius is one of adding instead of multiplying, the units will not cancel out in an equation, and I'll show you that in one of the examples. Kinetic molecular theory explains this gas law as well. If we increase the temperature of a gas sample, that means the particles are moving faster. Particles moving faster are going to hit the walls more frequently, and they're going to hit them harder. And so to keep the pressure the same, we have to expand the volume to cut down on how frequently they're hitting the walls. Here's, here's an interesting demonstration. And this is, you know, there's a couple things here that you could do at home. This is one of them. So you can inflate a balloon. Just with air is fine. And, and don't make it super big. Just make it kind of medium size. And stick it in ice water. And it will get smaller, noticeably smaller. And then take that balloon and put it in boiling water, and it'll get bigger. And you can see at home the relationship that cold temperature, small volume. Low temperature, low volume. High temperature, high volume. And these gas laws were figured out so long ago, you know, back in the 16, 17, 1800s, because the gases are really easy to experiment with doesn't require a lot of technology or anything. So we can use Charles' law to calculate um, changes in volume and temperature. And so this is how we state the equation. V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. And again, really important, got to use Kelvins. Won't work if you use Celsius. And that's a common mistake that students make. They forget to convert. Let's do an example. A sample of gas has a volume of 2.80 liters at an unknown temperature. When the sample is submerged in ice water at 0 degrees Celsius, its volume decreases to 2.57 liters. What was its initial temperature? And they want to know in Kelvins and in Celsius. So we're going to make a table and organize this information. So we've got 1 and 2. The first number we come across is 2.80 liters. Now, sometimes in the equation, I mean, in the problem, it'll say volume of, and that's nice. But you should be able to recognize that liter is a unit of volume, atmosphere is a unit of pressure, and degree Celsius is a unit of temperature. So even if they don't tell you the name of the quantity, you can figure it out from the unit. So that's a volume. At an unknown temperature. Okay, well, that's not a number. That's, that's probably part of the question, right? So let's go on and find all the numbers. The sample submerged in ice water at zero degrees Celsius. That's a temperature. Uh, we don't want to put that in the volume column. So zero degrees Celsius. This is temperature. This is the time to convert to Kelvins. 
when you're organizing things. You say to yourself, oh, wait a minute, that temperature is in Celsius, but we have to use Kelvins. So remember, to convert to Kelvins, you just add 273. So that ends up equaling 273 Kelvins. So that's the temperature in the second condition. The volume decreases to 2.57 liters, so 2.57 liters. We have one blank, one empty square. This is good. The question is, what was the initial temperature? So in here, this is the T column, so we'll call it T, and it's row 1, so we're going to call that T1. That's what we're trying to find. Then we need our equation. I was on the previous slide. V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. We're trying to find T1. Now this is where things can get a little messy. I have a friend who teaches uh, junior high math. And she tells her students that fraction is the F word. We've got fractions in this equation. People don't like fractions. Do you know that four out of three people have trouble with fractions? <laughs> right? Including the person that made that t-shirt. Um, so the best strategy here is to get rid of the fractions by cross multiplying. Some of you are great with algebra. And so you can just look at that and rearrange it. So I'm not talking to you right now. You just go ahead and do that, solve the problem, be done. Others of you, algebra just never really made sense. And so you just need a little more help, and we'll get you through it. We want to get rid of the fractions because people tend to get the wrong answer when they don't do that. So cross-multiplying means that we take the numerator on one side, the top, and we multiply by the bottom on the other side. So we end up with V1, T2. And that is equal to the bottom of the first side times the top of the other side. So T1, V2. It doesn't matter which order. If you put T2, V1, and V2, T1, as long as you have them together, because 2 times 4 is 8, and 4 times 2 is 8. The order doesn't matter. Any questions about cross-multiplying? Now we've gotten rid of the fractions, it's easier to rearrange this equation. So we're looking for T1. I'm going to make that red again so we can see it. I love having all these colors. So we're looking for T1. That means that we need to divide by what's with it over there. We need to divide by V2 because V2 over V2 equals 1, and poof, it goes away. If we divide one side by V2, we have to divide the other side. So we'll divide by V2 over here. And then, you know, it's all kind of scribbly and messy there, so then we'll copy it down. And I'm going to put T1 on the left, because that's how we're used to looking at things. T1 equals, and then we're going to copy down the rest of that. V1, T2, over V2. And just double check that you copied your subscripts correctly. The ones and twos are super easy to mix up. So there's your equation. And at a bare minimum, you should have this equation um, written down. Okay, if you don't want to write down all the rearranging parts, that's fine. But you should always show your work, even for online homework. You should write it all out. Don't try to just do it in your head and guess at it. Write it all out. If you get the answer wrong, then you can go back and look. Oh, shoot, you know, I put the two in the wrong place or something and figure it out. Or I rearranged the equation wrong. And that way you can learn from your mistakes. Because there, you know, mistakes don't do any good if you don't learn anything. So we'll take this equation and we'll put the numbers in. 
And they're all organized in the table over there. So V1 was 2.80 liters. And T2 was 273 Kelvin. And V2 is in the bottom is 2.57 liters. We look at our units, liters cancel out, so that's a good sign. And then we do the math. Two point eight times two seventy three divided by two point five seven equals, and this number should have three significant figures. So this equals, I'll put it over here. So T one equals two hundred and ninety seven Kelvin. Are we done? No. We've only answered part of it. It wants the temperature in Kelvins and in Celsius. So this is one answer, but then we need to convert this to Celsius, and we do that by subtracting 273. We're going to use that number 273 a lot, and so you should remember that number. I'm not going to give you that on an, on an exam. 297 minus 273 equals 24. So 24 degrees Celsius. So there were two answers there. 297 Kelvin and 24 degrees Celsius. Those are the same temperature. Does the answer make sense? We took a, a sample of gas, you know, you can imagine it being a balloon, and put it in ice water the volume went down. So that tells us that the original temperature must have been higher than zero, right? Because when the volume goes down, that means that the temperature went down. So here 24 is higher than zero, and so that's good. Any questions? Let's just look at this and see what would happen if we used Celsius instead. So that temperature in Celsius was zero degrees Celsius. So over here, if instead of 273 Kelvin, I put in zero degrees Celsius, what would my answer come out to be? It would come out to be zero degrees Celsius. Is that the same as 24? No, it's not. So you can't do that. It doesn't come out to be the same answer. If your volumes were in milliliters or gallons or any unit as long as they were both the same unit it would cancel out and be fine but temperature doesn't work that way so we cannot do that we'll just make it go away it'd be nice if you could do that in real life oops but no one to stop 